Today on Up at Noon, Han Solo movie shakeups. What does it mean for Star Wars? The Nintendo Switch is having a fantastic week. Good job, Switch. And we've got a ton of awesome Spider-Man stuff to play with. All that and more, this is Up at Noon. Hey! Hey! Welcome. We're back. It's up at noon live. This is actually live, not like pre-recorded because somebody's on vacation or because we're prepping for E3. We are actually live, unless you're watching a recording of this, in which case we're not. But really, is anything real anymore? Nothing is real. No. Yeah, um, we have a new announcement that nothing you know is real. Yeah. It's all a lie and it's fake. Yeah. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be back. You're also Brian Altano. I'm Brian Altano. You're Max Scoville. We had E3 last week. If you watched that, thank you. <laughs> that, took, oh, that took a lot out of everybody. <laughs> And it's good to have that. We spend half the year being like, E3's coming, and during that time, all we also say is, when, as soon as E3's done, we're gonna, we're gonna do all those things we always want. We're gonna clean the attic, we're gonna go to the gym, we're gonna start cooking, we're gonna call our, call our friends more. I had E3 nightmares last night. About, it's, like, it's, like, it's like finals, you know? You're like, oh, I'm late for an appointment, there's a bunch of things, it was, it was all very bad. Um, and the good news is we don't have to do anything like that again for like, Three hundred. No, we got a Comic Con, and then oh. maybe Gamescom. Yeah, and then anyway, we love our jobs and we have a fun time doing them, especially this particular show right here, which you can watch on all sorts of different things, such as IGN.com, YouTube.com/IGN, Twitch.tv/IGN, the Facebook IGN, and then all the various apps like Roku, Apple TV, PS4, Xbox One, and. Bleem or whatever that other one is that they always put in emails. We still don't know what it is. You really don't like that one. Yeah. I, don't, I don't even Bleem. know what it is. It, my thing with Bleem is if we ignore it long enough, maybe it'll just go away. Yeah. 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 Like, class, how... like classmates.com. Where are they? <laughs> exactly. They grew up. Yeah. Suck at MySpace. Tom, we still friends? I don't think so. I don't think so. Anyway. Uh, you can also interact with us uh, throughout the show using uh, the comments on YouTube and Twitch, but also using the hashtag up at noon on Twitter. We'll be monitoring all those things. We have them yeah, everywhere. Got, I wish we could show you. We've got these two TVs that show what the chat is saying. A bunch of people in the YouTube chat are saying a lot of great stuff. Nathan Payson says E3 was during my finals. Yep. Uh, some guy named Question Marks says, Max, can you adopt me? Legally, no. And then there's a guy named Epic Face over in our Twitch chat that's just spamming that reptilians are coming back. Hiss. That's he has a bunch odd. of pictures of snakes. Yeah. Very exciting. Internet's a crazy place to be. It is a good place to be. Uh, and we got a ton of news this week, so we're going to get through some of the bigger, smaller things, jam them all together, and yeah. then, we'll, then we'll chill out and we'll get through yeah. some, we, some fun stuff. We write this show every week. And so then there's always a bunch of stuff that happens on Thursday morning, and we're like, we should get that in there. So let's start this off. Yeah. Uh, first things first, the Steam summer sale has started. Alliteration. The steamiest Yeah, the sale. steamiest, uh, uh, the one true Gaben has decided that once again he shall slash prices across the board with his many tactical knives. And if you're a PC gamer, uh, you know, head on to Steam, and, uh, and you get the discounts, the savings, as it were. Uh, and then, of course, if you don't have a gaming rig or whatever, uh, and you have a small portable telephone that can be used to download things from the internet, uh, Sega just announced that they're doing this thing called Sega Forever Classic Games Collection, which is basically uh, legal emulation. Um, yeah. It is uh, a bunch of classic Sega games, uh, and they're free to play. Uh, there's like cloud saves, there's yeah, I controller a support. Yeah, I couple right on my phone, because they're all free right now. So I grabbed Altered Beast, which I don't care what you say, that's a bad game. It's just a bad game. I get it. A man turns into many yeah, animals in that game, and really... historically that's cool. Uh, it's not a good game. Uh, there's also Fantasy Star 2, there's Comic Zone, which is pretty awesome, and Kid Chameleon. Which yeah, is and they, I like that they're just kind of like, hey man, like we, we put Bayonetta on PC or whatever, you get Vanquish on there if you want, but really like, people like Sega because of the 90s, man, get some Kid Chameleon and Crazy Taxi. But it's cool because it's like, it's, it's, if you want to play them ad free, it's a buck ninety nine. It just seems like a re very reasonable way to go about doing this kind of thing. Yeah, the cool um, thing about it too, uh, we talked about uh, some of the retro bit controllers that work uh, Bluetooth wirelessly with Switch. Those are also also work with your Android or iOS device. So say you're like, I want to play these games, but you know, I don't want to play them with touchscreen controls because that's terrible. And you're right. And Altered Beast is bad. I can hear what you're saying. And Echo is not a good game either. I hate that dolphin. I like the actually no. While I don't like here. the here. I like the Altered Beast boys because they're just like they seem like they just got out of the bathhouse and they're yeah. just like riled up. Uh, anyway, so you can play these things with standard controls. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they've got ads in them, but they're free. And if you're one of those it's, people that yeah. can deal with it, that's fine. But yeah, they're really leaning into this '90s aesthetic, um, and it's it's very smart. Yeah. I'd like to see this stuff on Switch. 
Yeah, that'd be cool too. I think they're probably working on it. I mean, Neo Geo jumped right on there, so I feel like yep. Sega's kind of you know coming up soon. Everyone but Nintendo. Um, yeah, go figure. Yep. Uh, anyway, in other news, uh, speaking of stuff from the 90s that we still are talking about, even though we are not in third grade anymore, uh, Jurassic World 2 has an official title, and it's Fallen Kingdom. Here's what the logo looks like. Uh, there's also a tagline. Oh, there we go. There it goes. Okay. Our logo's better anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we like ours. Look at that. Um, the tagline is Life Finds a Way. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. I'm looking forward to the uh, third one. You know one. why it is, right? Because Mr. Jeff Goldblum is Hell yeah. for this movie. I don't know how they keep hood hoodwinking that man to come back and his daughter was, that does I hope we'll get karate like a, on the Raptors. I hope we get one that's like Jurassic World Chaos Theory or something. Like, I'd love it that's if they lean in all the stuff that he's always. If you read the, the Jurassic Park book, it's like, it's pretty awesome. And he's always like talking about like weird math that he kind of touches on in the, in the movie, but mm -hmm. mostly you're just like, what's this? Dude's deal. So you they're just gonna keep pulling old quotes. So they'll be like Jurassic World Four. Ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh, Jurassic World Five. Word. Clever girl. That's great. Yeah, I think I, it's a good idea. Yeah, the, um, the title's weird. The movie's not out for a full year, so uh, this is a little early. But I, I think it's cool that you know, not like we needed to see the logo, but it's the Jurassic World logo or Jurassic Park logo, just a little more beaten down. Yeah. And uh, Fallen Kingdom's a weird subline. I mean. I guess I don't like it at all. It's it feels like something from a, like a, a fantasy movie, a Lord of the Rings. It movie sounds or like a Transformers movie title. Yes, which makes sense. Maybe that's what they're angling for because I don't know. They also we don't we don't have numbered sequels anymore. Yeah, like, that's the thing because people are like, oh no, five. I did not see four, but they're like Fallen Kingdom, and there could have been one you just entirely skipped, and you're yeah. like. I will see the dinosaurs in the film again. And so to recap what we remember we heard about this film a while back, which we covered on the show, uh, basically the dino DNA technology is out there in the wild, third parties are ripping it off, kind of like fidget spinners and you know fidget cubes and other things that start with fidget. <laughs> And uh, people all over the world, or companies all over the world, are trying to make bootleg knockoff dinosaurs, God, which is... I think, you don't like gonna, it? I think it's gonna be great. I, well, so, I hope that they really lean into it and they're just the worst. They're well, this just, is what I'm thinking, right? Busted ass dinosaurs. Yeah, like I mean, if you get like you ever seen like a like a, a bootleg Taiwanese iPhone and it's just not the way it should yeah. be. Like I wanna see that, but with a T-Rex, he's got just one long left arm, you know? It's just weird. It's, one of them is just like they just have like a golden retriever. They're like, look at the new dinosaur. They're like, that's a dog, dude. You yeah. Didn't even, you, did you not even look at the dinosaurs? I think, I think we're gonna see a bunch of like genetic monster dinosaurs, yeah. which could be really interesting. There's just like a regular horse, but it's got the Harry Potter logo on it, but it's just yep. like Harry Zombie. And you're like, what are you, what are you cloning? Yep. Anyway, um, big news, big news, big news. We talked about this a lot. We're going to talk about a bunch of Spider-Man stuff because serendipitously a bunch of Spider-Man products have come out in advance of the new film. Uh, the other film that's on the way is, of course, Sony is developing a Venom movie starring Tom Hardy. We've seen that Tom Hardy's already working out in a Venom shirt. That's very exciting. I'm glad we, he's finally working out. Yeah, that guy was always kind of a kind of a little shrimpy wiener. He what was, a tubby, he wasn't what just a, a tubby tubby. He wasn't just a terrifying fist of a man in every film he's ever been in. Uh, they're adding Carnage. Carnage is gonna be the villain in the Venom movie. Uh, this gets weird though because they're also announcing, they, they're really not good at the whole like, less is more approach to just announcing stuff. They also announced that they're working on spin-off movies that feature Kraven the Hunter and Mysterio. Unclear exactly how much that's gonna tie in because it's still unclear exactly how much Tom Holland as Spider-Man will even have to do with this because he's, uh, he's on board for, I think, in addition to Infinity War, it's Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3. He's yeah. got three movies. And we don't really know where that lives in relation to the MCU. So, or if maybe, he's legally allowed to show up in this movie as Spider-Man. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a mess. It's a tangled web. Is yeah, what it, it is. really is. Uh, uh, this, this whole thing's weird. It's like, just, it, I so it's it sucks because I, I was really big into Maximum Carnage, that like miniseries that yeah. ran across a whole. It spanned across, across like five or six different. Um, it was like Venom, and, yeah. and it was just all these different spin-offs. It was an event. It was an event. It was awesome. And you had to go to the store every month and collect a different one that was basically in a different line. And if you had told me, you know, in the 90s that in 2017 we would get this badass, incredibly good-looking version of that story in some way, I would have been the most excited kid in sure, the world. Sure, sure. But then if you told me, like, oh, well, legally, uh, some people own Spider-Man for some time, but then there's also going to be crazy. Yeah. I'd be like, stop. Like, dude, this, I feel like Sony was completely doing the right thing for a second where they're like, hey, you know, the Marvel movies are great. We worked out a deal. They get Spider-Man. They're going to make Spider-Man Homecoming. He's yep. going to show up in Civil War. It's going to be really cool. And everyone's like... Good, thank you, finally. Because up until that point, they were like, we're making a Sinister Six movie, we're making an Aunt May TV show. And you're like, stop. They're like, we're making an entire Green Goblin trilogy. It's like, no, 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 stop doing that. Don't do that anymore. And then they were like, oh no, you just want Spider-Man in the MCU? Okay, here you go. And then they're like, no, no, we changed our mind. Craven the Hunter gets his own Feature film. I don't want a Craven movie. He's fine, but he's cool when he fights, fights Spider-Man. Like it's also like I get the whole anti-hero thing. That's really big right now in pop culture. I mean, almost every TV show has a sort of like a not defined 
sort of principal main character who is good that you can fight for the entire way. Everyone is flawed and complicated, but Venom specifically is just an evil <sighs> bag of garbage. And to put him up against eviler bag of garbages and saying, uh, he's not as bad as those guys are. Like, it's just weird, right? What about the sinister dumpster of garbage and I'm, six I'm different that. bags of garbage that they all have to fight? Like, are you gonna watch the Craven the Hunter origin movie? I mean, if I'm <laughs> kind of. if I'm like blackout drunk on a plane, maybe, and the seat back TV's broken and I can't watch something else, like A Dog's Porpoise 2, which is a film they announced. Anyway, it's not, it's not a, a dog's, dog's porpoise. porpoise, it's a dog's purpose. <laughs> Sorry, we kept did making fun of it. Did they announce something? Yeah, they're making a second dog's purpose. So what? Josh Gad is back as the dog that keeps getting reincarnated. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Third <sighs> place to get movie news. Yeah, sure. okay. So the biggest news of the week, I would say, in terms of the things we talk about <coughs> in the show, specifically for brain-damaged adult third graders, uh, the directors of the Han Solo standalone movie have parted ways with the Han Solo movie. I don't know if they were sort of unceremoniously let go or fired Creative out of a differences, cannon. killed yeah. off. Um, uh, but yeah, it's- uh, Exited it's, off the lot. Uh, it's Chris Miller and Phil Lord. You may know them from uh, this cool photo of them looking cool. Uh, and their various movies they've made for hip young fidget spinning, spinner toting millennials, such as the Lego movie, Clone High, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, and 21 Jump Street. Mm -hmm. um, they look like that, that's them. We're not gonna see them directing the film anymore because apparently they're too goofy. So they went and got Ron Howard. Well, you may know <coughs> uh, as uh, as the voice of the Sandlot, the disembodied yep. voice of the Sandlot. He also has directed, you know, Oscar-winning movies like A Beautiful Mind, The Da Vinci Code, and How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which did not win Oscars. But um, basically, I think that they pulled him in to be like, "Hey, we're looking for sort of a safer bet. These guys are taking too much of a comical angle. They're like they said, creative differences. We don't really know the full story. We maybe will hear about it." in you know, years and years from now. Mm -hmm. What's worth noting though is that Ron Howard uh, has a long-standing relationship with George Lucas, yeah. which I think is interesting because he probably has, I mean, obviously the, uh, you know, the uh, Lord Miller have their, their whole like, they grew up with Star Wars, they love Star Wars, they are, they are Star Wars fans, but at the same time, Ron Howard also directed Willow, which was one of George Lucas's other little set side projects. So, and he, he knows the guy, so maybe he knows what his like, his angle would have been. But that being said, this is kind of a weird thing to happen kind of switching horses midstream here. Where, where did where did history land on Willow, by the way? Because what I love that movie as a kid, I haven't seen it in a very long time. Is that like the kind of thing where people are like, I love that movie, it's a great movie, and uh, a cinematic masterpiece. So I feel like it's one of those ones that sort of fell in the holes of yeah, time. Yeah, it kind of fell through the cracks. I mean, it's, it's a weird one because it, in the same way that Star Wars was what uh, Lucas made when he couldn't get the rights to Flash Gordon, Willow is what he made when he couldn't get the rights to The Hobbit. Yeah. Allegedly, I don't know if that's entirely true, but it's got its own kind of weird... It's I like it better. Val Kilmer. Honestly. Um, yeah, so let's talk about this a little bit, though. Uh, we're getting a ton of new Star Wars movies. Uh, we're getting them from all kinds of different directors. We, you know, we've got, um, you know, Colin Trevorrow, and we've got Gareth Edwards, and... Ryan until Johnson. Now. Yeah, and they're these dudes who have, like, their own, you know, directorial style. Uh... But Star Wars movies are, it seems like maybe they're just kind of going to be Star Wars movies. Yeah, so I think our big concern, and this has been an emotional roller coaster as Star Wars fans to watch the Han Solo thing. Because um, that news hit, uh, you know, whenever it did a couple years ago, and immediately uh, you were in two camps. One was like, I'm on board, this is the best idea ever. Or the other was, I don't think they should make a Han Solo origin story. Then you started hearing about the people involved. You started realizing that it's gonna happen no matter what. It's stupid to just say, I won't watch this, because it's like 90 minutes of your yeah. life. And if you like Star Wars, you like Star Wars. And ideally, the people making it like Star Wars, right? right? But I think when we all went to go see The Force Awakens, there was this a like kind of sort of tremendous weight lifted off, off of us that was, okay, Star Wars is back. It's safe right now. Um, it's a little paint by numbers, but they're doing a lot of cool ideas. They've introduced a lot of new, new characters. There's a baton, ta you mm -hmm. know, passing here. This is ha this is a generational. Reboot. Yeah, I mean, the first line of the movie is this should begin to make things right, yes. which I think is the most transparent. And I think that I think that Abrams really got that. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I mean, people are like the Force Awakens is derivative. <laughs> no, it, it is also kind of establishing that like this isn't you know this isn't going to jerk the wheel. This isn't going to go crazy. A lot of people uh, were kind of alienated by the prequels because they. They were simultaneously keeping things too close to home, but also shaking things up a lot and, and sort of reinventing what the original trilogy sort of right. established, which, uh, I mean, they're, they're very different trilogies. And yes. they're, both, they're both like Lucas's baby, but he was in a very different spot between when those two were made. Mm -hmm. um, what they do have in common, though, is that they're experimental. They're totally trying new things, and they're, they're kind of weird. 
Uh, I mean, the first Star Wars movie was made by a, it was made a, a, as an affront to the studio system. Like Lucas was kind of going rogue with that and how it got made. Uh, and it, he continued that throughout the, the whole system. The fact that he was making movies out of Northern California instead of Hollywood was in itself like kind of being like, kind of being a bad boy in terms right. of how people did things. Uh, and it was a bunch of like, you know, weird dudes kit bashing model kits and like lighting stuff on fire. At one point they had a water slide going out of uh, Skywalker Ranch and a bunch of dudes from Fox came by and they were like, um, who are these bearded men water sliding out of our offices? And yeah, like, like what is happening yeah. here? I mean, they were shooting the, the movie in, in, in insane new ways that no one had ever seen before. This sort of mix between special effects and models and etching things on the like laser prints. Yeah. There was puppetry. There was men in weird wolf costumes and that, getting drunk at a bar. Yeah, and that carries over to the prequels to a certain degree because at that point, Lucas had all this money and he was willing to try all these crazy new things. Yeah. And he was like, hey, uh, episode two, um, it's gonna be the first feature film entirely shot on digital. Also, half the stuff in it's not gonna be there, it's gonna be all green screen. And I mean, it hasn't necessarily aged great, but, and some of the performances are weird because people weren't used to acting opposite things. But sure. that helped lay the groundwork for so much stuff. Like I just watched Beauty and the Beast last night. If that had been made in 2003, it would be pretty much unwatchable. Mm -hmm. But the fact that all of the stuff that Lucas helped you know, drive home with, with special effects and by experimenting, I mean, Star Wars has always been sort of a tech demo and kind of a test bed for strange new technologies. And I think they're still doing that to a certain degree behind the scenes, but in terms of taking a risk, it's still this like, you know, just cherished franchise, and they're, I think, scared of shaking it up too much. Yeah, and so when you and I walked out of The Force Awakens, we said that was a great time, we, we both cried in the theater, it was awesome, like, it was really cool, and then we both sort of settled in a little bit, saw it three or four more times mm -hmm. each, and said, now I can't wait for Star Wars to get weird. Like, they got the good stuff, the good sort of, like, boilerplate, uh, straightforward, make everybody happy, remind everyone that it's back, yeah. and it's not broken. And then we were like, we wanted to get weird. And then we started seeing, you know, um, some of the shots of some of the aliens in the background of Rogue One, and uh, some of the concept art, and some of the stuff we started hearing about some things in uh, Episode Eight, And it started to feel like, yeah, this is going to get weird again. And then Rogue One happened, and it was like, it's a fun movie, yeah. you know, it's not without I mean, its problems. It, it but. was definitely like staying in line with the style guide, which is fine. I mean, there is a Star Wars style guide. It's a little bit a little bit nebulous, and I think someone comes in and sort of adds something new that shakes things up a little bit. Uh, I hope that we get some strange stuff in episode eight that yeah. really kind of helps just push things in new directions. Uh, but yeah, and I mean, there was a point where things were kind of too off the rails, and I think, I think Lucas himself threw some stuff at the prequels that maybe were just either like, too goofy, too colorful. I mean, you got characters like Watto and Jar Jar that kind of like almost almost screw up the whole like the the ground. Like, where's the, like you got like a flying character and that never actually really plays a huge part, yep. you know? Yep. Um, but yeah, I want to see more stuff like that. But if you go and read like Dark Horse comics from the mid two thousands, they got like they went way overboard. There was some stuff in there that just didn't fit at all. And yeah, so I think that, that yeah. that's the big concern right now, right? It's like you get Lord and Miller to come in and make a weird Star Wars movie. Obviously, they're shooting differently than probably anyone's ever been used to with Star Wars because their 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 style is improv. Mm -hmm. They shoot seven seven versions of yeah. the same thing and see to see what works. And maybe that doesn't work for Han Solo and Chewbacca. So yeah, right? that's what's worth noting is in addition to this being like this is not just a Lord and Miller movie. This is this is within a larger construct yeah. of everything else. This is Lord and Miller shooting a script that's written by Lawrence Kasdan, who yeah. wrote Empire and, and Force Awakens. Uh, the cinematographer is the guy who's worked with uh, Dennis Villanueva for uh, like Sicario and the new Blade Runner, who's got this incredible visual style. I don't know how that even translates to doing stuff. To improv? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking the same like, thing, Like you have yeah. this beautiful, hugely framed, like storyboarded shot, and then there's just like, you know, Donald Glover and, and Alden Ehrenreich goofing around in the foreground. Like, right, which is a little yeah. different than like shooting in a, you know, shooting in the back lot of a school uh, for 21 Jump Street and having Jonah Hill vamp on drugs for 25 yeah. minutes and, and picking the best take. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the coolest thing we could see with Star Wars to just sort of test the waters and go different directions is these movies, they're called anthologies, but they're not really anthologies, they're standalone motion pictures. I'd like to see an actual anthology movie that's a bunch of shorter pieces by different directors showing the different directions Star Wars could go. Yeah, yeah, and I really hope it can get that way because right now when we heard, we heard Rogue One was gonna be a war movie, and it mostly was in the back third of it, right? Mm -hmm. And we heard that Han Solo movie was gonna be sort of like a heist movie or like a buddy cop type of type of thing, and we don't know where that's gonna land either. So the, the promise was kind of, or maybe maybe we promised ourselves, that these spin-offs and side stories would sort of tell a, a version of Star Wars in a different genre than we're used to, rather than massive space opera. Mm -hmm. And yet it all seems to keep funneling back to that, which is good, which is fine, I love that, but I want it to get weird. I want 
Like, I, I think about the scene in Jabba's Palace, right, which is my favorite scene in all of Star Wars. It's 20-something minutes long, it's completely insane, and I don't think it would ever happen now. When we got, Ma you know, Maz Kanata's castle, it was like a couple of minutes, and it was pretty straightforward. It was a vehicle for a couple of conversations between, you know, a bear and a sure. girl and the like a, a yeah, small I mean, but those are all those woman. are all various like kind of reinterpretations of the the, the original cantina scene. Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, what's the what's the equivalent of something like the cantina scene? And I think like Lucas did that with the pod race. He yep. just threw this like he's like here's a, here's something you haven't seen before. Really, yeah. it's kind of nuts. Um, so I don't know. I hope it, I hope it gets weird. Hope it gets strange. And I hope that uh, I, I hope that weird directors decide to come in and work with Star Wars. I yeah. hope that like they keep that open. Uh, that that conversation gets. I mean, I don't know what happened here, right? It, we've, this is unprecedented, to mm -hmm. be completely frank. Like we've never really seen on this level, not since something like Superman two, have we seen a directors of this caliber exit a project of this caliber this late in production mm -hmm. with three and a half weeks left in shooting and just a few months left in editing. So. We'll see if Ron Howard can come in, clean it up, keep it weird, keep it funny, um, and where Star Wars goes from here. Yeah. Uh, Modern Chow in the chat says, a la Animatrix, yes please. Maybe that's another option, is instead of just big, uh, you know, live action feature films, is get a yep. bunch of like weird art students to make some, like, Gendy Tartakovsky's Clone Wars micro series help launch the Clone Wars cartoon, and that was beautiful, but yeah, get him to make a Boba Fett short, yeah. please, for the love of God. Well, it was a weird week for Star Wars, but it was kind of an awesome week for Nintendo Switch. You might not have noticed uh, because E3 just happened and there's a whole lot of things going around and maybe you didn't really think to dig into uh, what the eShop is really capable of, but the Nintendo Switch had a really awesome week, uh, starting with ARMS, which just launched at the tail end of E3. Um, this is a game that I did not expect to be nearly as fun as it actually is. When I first saw this thing, I was sort of like, oh, this feels like a sort of goofy casual fighting game. Uh, it feels like uh, the, we're not getting the punch out game we should be getting because we're getting these like weird men and women with like spring spring appendages. Yeah, it felt kind of akin to how, how Nintendo Land wasn't a Mario Party game, even though it yeah. kind of was. And like I was like, there's motion controls, and then I spent like five hours playing this thing on a flight to Tokyo, and I totally fell in love with it. Uh, it's developing a a fantastic uh, community around hardcore players, b a really awesome community around artists who are completely latching on at some of these characters, Twintel especially because she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just got this great cast of characters. It's really diverse and beautiful. Uh, the art direction's gorgeous. It's super fun. And uh, there's DLC promised for the extended future that will all be free. So I'm totally into that. If you're looking for a casual slash hardcore fighting game to play on your Switch, uh, that's the one. I actually haven't played it with motion controls, but I heard it's awesome with that too. Um, we'll do that for a second at a demo. It felt yeah, very, very yeah, like right. reboxing. Yeah, yeah. So check that out. But that's the big one, right? That's the big first party one and part of Nintendo's promise of giving us a big first party game every other month. But there's a bunch of other cool stuff that just launched too. Uh, check your eShop every now and then if you're like, Switch has no games. Yes, it does. You just got to expand your palette a little bit. Uh, Shantae, Half Genie Hero, which was, I believe, originally a Wii U game, um, just launched for the system, too. It's got Metroidvania elements. It's got this kind of booty dancing uh, sort of witch woman who uses her hair. That was to actually whip. The, the working title was Booty Dancing Witch Woman. Yep, yep. Uh, and her thing is that she can transform into different animals. Uh, like a spider or like an elephant and barge through walls. Uh, the levels are really cool. The, you're kind of given the excuse to go back uh, and find secrets in them. Um, it's really fun. It's really charming. The art direction is is great. Like the animation's awesome and the music's really good too. Uh, and you know, you saw from th at, from 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 E3, uh, we are getting Metroid games. We're getting one for 3DS, and eventually we're getting Prime Four for for Switch. But we're yeah. not really getting anything that's sort of Metroidvania. Now, Shovel Knight's on the Switch now. It's got some elements of that, but um, jump on this game. It's really cool. It's 20 bucks. It'll last you around 7 to 10 hours to 100% it, and I really dig it. On top of that, Mega Man. We talked earlier about the Virtual Console not really happening on Switch right now outside of the Neo Geo games. Mega Man uh, was supposed to get a resurgence with Mighty Number no. 9. We all know how that turned out. No reason to dig up that old corpse. But uh, Mighty Gunvolt Burst just launched on the Switch. It's 10 bucks. It's very 8-bit. It's gorgeous, and it's got two characters in it. Uh, Gunvolt, who had his own 3DS games, and uh, what's his? Mighty uh, Number no. Nine. Mighty Number no. Nine. His, his, he's got a name. Is I forget it. It's Hank Steven. or something. Steven. Steven, Steven the Burst Boy. Uh, so this game is awesome. All the comments are gonna be really mad at me right now. But this game is really cool. It's got eight robot masters. You can go through each level and uh, defeat them. And at the end, there's like a big boss rush mode, and you have to fight a sort of wily type character. But this is my favorite thing about it. If you look at the menus here, you can go into basically a debug menu for every single character in this game, and tweak every element 
of their weaponry, their their traversal, their huh. ability to air dash. Uh, there's tons of different things to unlock and find. Um, I'm about six hours into this game. As you can see, there's hidden areas. It's really, really fun. It's really special. Uh, total good deal for 10 bucks. Two characters, and I find myself um, going in and replaying levels to find extra stuff and hidden items. So yeah, check this one out if you're starved for Mega Man, which I was. This is the Mighty Number no. Nine game we should have got last year. Yeah, what a bummer that, that the one that they actually you know had all the hype around was. Yeah, didn't I mean, the Mighty Number no. Nine was supposed. To, it was a Kickstarter, you know, darling. It was supposed to have an, its own anime. There are supposed to be physical rewards. That awful whole, doll. Yeah, that awful doll. All these all these weird things came out of it. Um, on top of that, Metroidvania games that I really dig. One of the classics is Cave Story. Uh, Cave Story has been on pretty much everything. It's originally a PC indie game. Nintendo a couple years ago partnered with this team called Nicholas, uh, or Nicholas. That, Nicholas! Nicholas! That brought this game over. This is the 3DS version we saw here, which had sort of poly uh, polygon yeah, remakes. Yeah, they kind of 2.5 D'd it for, yeah. the, for, to work better in 3D, right? Uh, so this game is out on Switch right now. It's 30 bucks, which is kind of pricey, yeah, that, but if you collect physical versions, the physical version is actually really cool. Um, if you get if you get it from the right places, it comes with a soundtrack CD, a booklet uh, that's very sort of NES Metroid Small pouch, style, and a little pouch with a keychain in it. Um, and one in 25 of them is apparently autographed, which is pretty cool. That's neat. But um, yeah, this is a super fun game. Uh, you play as like this sort of 8-bit boy, and you get these awesome guns, and you get to mess stuff up. Yeah, and we also got a system update, which yeah. is I, I'm very excited about this personally. Uh, let's take a look here. This might look like a normal. Normal system right here, but it, it, the colors are inverted. Yeah. So if you've got vertigo vision and you need to see upside down colors, well now you can. Also they have black and white mode, which will just make Puyo Puyo Tetris impossible. Yeah, so the uh, Switch update 3.0 hit this week. It's far and away the biggest update we've seen in the system yet, and it's exciting because everything we've gotten so far has been like a stability update, mm -hmm. which really means nothing. It means they're just moving the Pikmin around inside the system. Yeah. Uh, this one uh, adds a really cool feature that lets you find your controller. Yeah, which you need to lost. do here, because like the controller's gone. Yeah, look at that, you yeah. photoshopped it out have of you, there. Have you seen the videos? Basically, it, it, it's just, it, it's like find my iPhone. Kind yeah. Of. It's just, but you just tap it, but if you, I think if you keep doing it, it just sounds like a little tiny trumpet. Yeah. Another cool thing it did is it raised the volume on the system as a whole. So when you're using it, say on an airplane or a train with headphones in, uh, you can actually hear it now, which is great for rhythm games. Um, yeah, whole bunch of cool stuff for this thing. Obviously, lots more. Uh, it's it let you use uh, wired controllers directly to the That's console. Awesome. All this cool stuff. So yeah, I'm excited to see that system grow over the next months and years because uh, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, and then of course the kind of the big thing, just grand scale of everything. Uh, Nintendo was really kicking some ass on the NPD, which is of course basically the, the Billboard charts of, of video game sales. And there's some stuff that's on there. Obviously, Injustice 2 was kind of the, the number one seller. GTA 5 has never left that list because mm -hmm. it's the best selling game probably ever or whatever. Uh, but yeah, like Mario Kart and uh, and Zelda were both selling fantastically. So yeah, I believe they were one and four respectively on the on the or two and four respectively on the on the MPD, which is awesome. If you play Mario Kart and you're worried about connecting with people online, uh, that won't be a fear. That's just this is all just a huge sigh of relief that like the Switch is it's it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's like, it's good. It's got it's getting good games. It's getting good good support. Yeah. Uh, third parties, obviously, big question mark after E3, but we'll get into that more another time. Uh, but yeah, congrats to the Switch. It's a cool week. Go get some indie games. Throw some money on the eShop. Up, up, update your uh, your OS and yeah. find your lost controllers. Now, of course, uh, everyone's like, yeah, the big the big Switch game is is Breath of the Wild. It's the greatest. It's, get that old man out of here. Get that Mario out of here. Uh, but we're getting another one. We're getting we're getting Mario Odyssey. Yeah. This year, same year as as Breath of the Wild. I, I, honestly, I, I haven't gone back and checked. I've just asked people offhandedly. Has there been a year when we've gotten two flagship like a Zelda and a Mario. I don't think to this extent. Um, maybe you'll get like one. And I'm not really on the same system. I don't believe. Right. Right. Like if you look at like not since the N64, uh, and even then, I think Ocarina of Time and Mario 64 were quite quite a bit apart. Yeah. But this game looks phenomenal. Uh, we got to play it at E3. We haven't really talked about it on the show, so I just wanted to take yeah. a few minutes to talk Dude, about. Dude, I'm so excited. Yeah. This is a very special game. So there's a lot of cool stuff that we found out since E3. Uh, number one, every costume that you've seen in this game 
has appeared in, except for this one, which is weird, no, has appeared yeah. in some way in a past Mario game or a Mario spin-off. I think Bowser's Tuxedo appeared in a Master P video at some point. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but you see him with the sombrero here. He actually originally wore that in a cutscene in a game called Kicks, which was like a, a Game Boy puzzle game that you might have played in arcades. There's so much cool stuff going on here. So the main thing now is that this is the first open world Mario game in 15 years. It's got this brand new power-up mechanic which lets you throw your hats and capture enemies not possessed. Nintendo was pretty uh, stern about that. And you can basically jump into these massive worlds and collect things. Now, the big thing you want to collect are moons. It's sort of replacing stars or shines, which you might remember from Sunshine. Uh, and the moons, are there are 30 to 50 in each world, which means these worlds are going to be huge. Like, this is going to be like a Breath of the Wild si sized Mario game which I'm incredibly excited about. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Also, the fact that they kind of gutted it mechanically. Yeah. The fact that this is a modern Mario game. I Like, I love Mario. I've never been super, like, crazy about Mario, like, just because I'm I kind of suck at platformers, but I always like the exploration side of things, so I liked 64, and Sunshine was fun, and, I mean, the little, little planets in, in Galaxy were super cool. Mm. Uh, but to have this on this huge scale, and to have, like, also, just the amount of strangeness going on. Yes. Like, New Donk City compared to, like, that weird low-poly, like, uh, Mario 2-looking area with mm -hmm. the, and this terrifying... There's a dinosaur, and there's a spider robot. Like, yeah, they're it's... just going all over the place. And that song? That song is so good! It's so good. They were playing at an E3 next to our booth for six days, and I still loved it. Uh, there's a lot of customization in this game that I think you'll get really into, because there's, like, a hat store yeah. in the game that you can bring your, your collectibles to and your coins and trade them in and start buying costumes. And since there, you saw some of those, like, 2D areas, uh, basically, when you jump into the 2D area, you'll retain your costume, and it'll be an 8-bit, kind of like in Mario Maker. Um, yeah, so like we said, 30 to 50 moons in every level, but it doesn't pull you out when you grab one. Uh, it lets you just keep going, which I think is really smart for like a portable system, right? Because you bring this somewhere, you're playing it, you get a moon, it doesn't yank you out and throw you back to the hub world, it just lets you keep going. So you just hit the button and go into sleep, and then, you know, go about your day and come back later. I think also just that, that freedom to kind of goof around, but it kind of almost being like lower stakes, you know? Yep. Like you're not going to be on some big dumb quest, you know? It's not going to be like, you've got to... Go fight a, a. I mean, there are boss fights and everything, but it's not like a. It's not like a Skyrim quest where you're like, "What the hell was I doing again?" Yeah, you know? you're like, "Where was I?" And I'm uh, sure if you hit start, it'll be like, "Oh, go kill yeah. that." You know, also, canary over there. Yeah, you just found out points. that uh, your ship, the Odyssey, the yeah. big hat that you go inside of, uh, you get to decorate, right? Yeah. There's so like it's, a, it's got this really cool thing where, like, I think when you conquer worlds or, or you know uh, defeat certain criteria, you'll get like a weird item from that world. So like, if you're fighting in like fake Paris, they'll give you a little like cartoon Eiffel Tower, and you can bring it back to your ship and sort of decorate your apartment like Animal Crossing style, which I'm totally into. Uh, we had this really cool moment at E3 where, you know, every year we book our appoint appointments with all the developers and publishers. We say, we're coming to your booth, we're going to play your games, check it out, and then we're going to vote on what our game at the show is. Uh, Odyssey won ours, obviously. Uh, you should go watch that video because it's really fun. But the coolest thing was we rolled... 12 people deep into this appointment. And we all took turns passing around the controller and we all had a really good time playing it. And I think the cool thing about it is that every single person who played the same area ran in a different direction and saw a different thing. So I think you're gonna have that sort of weird thing that we had with Zelda where like Max will come in and he'll be like, oh, I went left from the green yeah. plane and I got lost for like six hours and I found like the ice stone god. And I'm like, I went right and fought a fire bat. Right, and I think that especially for a portable console like this, I mean, it's disingenuous to call it a handheld. It's a portable console. Mm -hmm. and the fact that we have these like adult playground moments where we're like, have you gone to Even Dot Island? You gotta check it out. Here, look, look at mine. And it's like bringing your copy of Nintendo Power to the playground and you know talking to your friends at lunchtime. Like, yeah, it's. it's it's cool. It's a good time. Yeah, I'm, it was I'm, just really awesome. We're really excited for it. It comes out in October, uh, and we can't wait to see more. And thank you to Nintendo for being so nice and accommodating and letting us roll 12 people deep in there. Uh, one group of, uh, of things at E3 that were not very nice or accommodating were the orcs. And they were very, very mean to my friend Max. Yeah, so bullies. Let's take a look. Everybody, Max here for IGN Access. I'm in E3 2017 at the Middle Earth Shadow of War. What's your name? Yeah, for sure. How do you, how's Shadow of War looking? Up here, uh, the, the piercings, it's very... Shut your mouth, pinched it. How's crowd control going here? It seems to be going pretty well. Are you worried at all about the representation of, uh, workish individuals in video games? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging, I'm trying. Shut your mouth. Well, thank you for your time. Lovely talking to you, Deathbone. Thank you, Max. 
Jacks who does not have enough syllables. You know what? I don't like to generalize, but I've interviewed a lot of people with things for my job, and works are kind of rude. Asshole, play! And we're back. That was very short. Those orcs were really, honestly, really surprisingly cool. We'll occasionally run into fun costume people at events, and uh, they're not usually in character that much, or that rude. Uh, also, I caught just a, a raft of crap for calling that Drake a Nazgul. I'm sorry. It's not a real animal either way. Looks like there's some orcs in the comments, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so, we've talked about Sphero's products before on the show. Uh, they make the cool little uh, app-controlled BB-8 from The Force Awakens. They had a very cool, uh, what is it, Lightning McQueen yep. car that like comes to life and hangs out with you. And their newest thing, which is uh, out in stores now, I believe, this is an app-enabled interactive Spider-Man. This is a little baby boy, whatever, but uh, he, uh, he has a lot to say. Let's go for a swing. Basically, Look at this his is... Eyes. Yeah. So basically, There's it's an old lady trying to cross the street right in front of a dark tunnel. Okay. Well, what do you want to do about it? Oh, careful, lady! You gonna save her? I'm not sure why they put a crosswalk right there. Okay. Anyway, so well, I'd swing her will to you the shut other up? Side, but I don't Just wanna make her hair turn hold on gray. a second. He wants to talk to you. <clears throat> so Be nice, Spider-Man. We can't see the cars coming out of the dark tunnel, so we'll have to use our superhuman hearing. Okay. We have to cross five lanes of traffic without getting decked. So after you hear the cars go by, quickly jump forward to the next lane. So you ready, ma'am? Yes, ladybug boy. <laughs> what the hell? Uh, <laughs> close enough. Doctor Lady, remember. That's my wait name, Doctor Lady. Cars to go by and then jump to the next lane. Here we go. until the cars pass. I thought I was. You almost got him hit by a car. Okay, so basically it's like a cross between an Amazon Echo and a Choose Your Own Adventure book. Yeah. Easy. Don't jump to the next lane until you hear the I don't, traffic. you're gonna kill him. Spider-Man. Hey, Spider-Man. I don't wanna do this anymore. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. We don't, we, we, you gotta stop playing in traffic. So basically you. there's an entire like story in here. There's a bunch of campaigns where you go fight enemies. I think yeah, Venom's actually in it. But it's like a little radio play. I think, I think, I think Spider-Man just wants to host the show. We can just we, take naps. Hey, stop. Stop talking. Right. Um, this thing is is surprising. Like, it's... it's. I think you look at it and you're like, I don't get it. It's like an expensive Funko Pop that talks or whatever, but he keeps talking. Um, I was just shaking him earlier and he started being like, hey, hey, quit it. You think it'll work? Hey, knock it off. He's still doing this old lady story. I kept shaking him and he's like, please stop, stop doing that. Quit it right now. And then he made like a throw up noise. If you swear at him, he'll like tell you not to swear. It's... He's still talking. He really loves traffic. Uh, he also does some other cool stuff like you can put him in your bedroom and tell him to guard the room. And when people come in, he'll start talking to them and being like, get out of here. Yeah. And then he'll tell you when you got home. So he's a snitch. He's very talky today. Hey, Spider-Man, tell us a joke. Tell us a joke. You doing it? Spider-Man, tell me a joke. Tell us a joke. Do it. I don't get it. Nothing passes the time quite like fighting some bad guys. Yeah, you don't could say- you know what's kind of fun? Origami. It's very relaxing. Um, so, right, let's, uh, let's check the scanner. Attention all units. Armed intruder at the Queens County Courthouse. Suspect is holding Judge Jigsaw. I don't think that's a real police scanner. Gonna, he keeps wanting to go back in traffic. We might have got one that just really likes traffic. He likes to go in traffic. Right, this is... Seriously, do you want some fries with that shake? Right? There we go, now we're shaking him. shaking me. Oh, jeez, I think I'm gonna puke. False alarm. Okay, something came up that time. Into laughing. Why are you doing this? I thought we were friends. Yeah, so it's weird to have a toy. You just like, made Spider Man barf. Yeah, I did. That's awesome. Uh, anyway, so it's. 
these guys clearly like they're they're like weird mad scientists who are making toys. If if Sphero wasn't making toys, I think they'd be Batman villains or Spider-Man villains, I guess. Oh, what the what are you doing? He's just really going. Also, there's like cop car noises coming out of his crotch. Shh, just and then he closes his eyes and goes There's to sleep. Oh, he went to anyway, sleep. Anyway, sorry. Uh, always a little bit weird, you know, demoing something like that. These things are like, they're really fascinating. I think we, we interviewed these guys about it and they had like like thousands of lines of dialogue. Uh, Spider-Man remembers stuff and they basically were looking at how kids interact with toys and when they play pretend and stuff. You can take him and have him like, you know, swing around your house in addition to making him throw up and he'll be like, <laughs> make like kicking and punching noises. Yeah, I was going to say, you think he'll remember that time you made him puke a few minutes ago? Probably. He's like, and I don't want to kill him in anymore. traffic. That um, was a weird, we, we went on some weird Spider-Man adventures. I hope the movie is half that interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's bizarre to be in that, like, in that future where it used to be like, here's a Spider-Man stuffed animal, I can pretend we're fighting crime together. And now we've got this, like, AI-enabled Teddy Ruxpin thing that will be like, we'll remember your name. Um, but yeah, they're very, uh, very adamant that there's no, like, there's, there's no way that, let me put this gently. Um, there's no way that pedophiles can hack into your kid's Spider-Man toy. They want to make sure that it's safe and it's all like kind of firewalled off, so it's not like what? That's just weird word. Or weirdos, I don't know. <laughs> the pedophiles, Spider-Man saying worst that enemy. word. Anyway, um, we've got some old-fashioned Spider-Man toys too. The fine folks at Hasbro sent over the latest wave of what? I can't say that on the show. No, you say all kinds of awful stuff on this show. Not no, I do not say you... that word on this show. I don't know why we can't say that word. Okay, let's th let's say a different <laughs> word. The man vulture. It's actually just the vulture. Uh, anyway, we got the new uh, Marvel Legends here. This is of Rah! course. Ah! It is I, the vulture. That's what he says in the movie. I saw. I saw behind it. We went to a set visit last week. Normally, we have like a tray that we bring out with these guys on them. They're all in this stupid box. Anyway, um, we talk about these guys all the time. This is the latest wave. You can find these wherever action figures are sold. They run about 20 bucks a piece. Mm -hmm. You got all kinds of great characters, such as the Beetle, who I like because he's weird and retro and fabulous. Then there is, uh, what is it, Cosmic Spider-Man, I believe. Yeah. Uh, there is the, there are a couple of these that are from, specifically from the Homecoming designs. Um, so there's Spider-Man with his, like, his crappy homemade costume, which has a little alternate hood with his hood up, so you can, you know, figure out how to do that. I think you just pop his head off and squeeze that on there. Uh, and then there's his full costume, which is a really, just really gorgeous. I think with, with movie tie-in stuff, they get, like, sort of more of a budget to work with. Spry, it is I, the Vulture! And, uh, as we've talked about on this fine program, Brian, uh, they usually have a Build-A-Figure, so it's like pieces that come with each figure that you can assemble. In this case, it's just the Vulture's wings. Yeah. Which is sort of a weird idea, so basically, like, this dude, I think, comes apart. There we you go. Can have the vulture kind of run around on his own with his, you know, funny hat and stuff. And his also, ski, his ski, a gorgeous jacket. action figure. But if you buy them all, you get all the wings and stuff, and you can have him do the scraw noises like you were demonstrating. Uh, there's also Tombstone. You might remember him from the, uh, the cartoons. I always hated him. He just looks like, just looks like a weird dude. I don't yeah, this 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 is like a weird. It's an interesting group as a line of toys because it's yeah. like. Two of them are like movie replicas, and, and then well, that's how they always do it. It's I think and it then keeps you have a whole bunch of them are just like who are yeah. these men? I think in the past they used to be like, hey, the Moon Knight fell over. Um, you know, they'd have like a whole they'd have a whole standalone line. They'd be like, oh, it's the X Men Origins line, and then that would take up short like store shelf space, and they the other movie would already be out, and they're like, we haven't moved these other ones yet. So mm -hmm. now they just kind of roll them all into Marvel Legends, and it I think it makes it easier for retailers and for collectors. But yeah. uh, aside from the build a figure stuff, which can be a hassle. Um, but yeah, they do good stuff. They're fun to play with. Uh, but that's not the that's not all the Spider-Man toys we have with us today. We have more Spider-Man. More Spider-Man than we you still can... we still haven't actually figured that out, right? Spider-Man. 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 I don't know. Uh, then of course, if you like to get mystery things in the mail, there is of course the Marvel Collector Core, which is uh, you know powered by Funko, and they just send they send mystery boxes through the mail. And this time it's all Spider-Man Homecoming theme. We got the usual patch and a pin. So we got the case. vulture. Yeah, it's a nice vulture pin. I really wish they would stop just putting the branding on there, because it's like it'd be cool to have like just a vulture patch, but the fact that it says Marvel Collector Core is kind of like, yeah, okay. It's like when you get like a Spider-Man toy and it just says Spider-Man on the side of it, and you're like, yeah, man, I know, dude. Like, he doesn't say that. Um, oh, Nobushin Gaming says, are you serious? You're showcasing toys. I'm leaving. Bye, Nobushin. We do this every week, dude. It's a toy show. We, like, what? How did you not? Yeah. What, what, what tipped you off? The warning signs were all there. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess the usual comic and a t-shirt. This is, of course, a little t-shirt of Midtown High, which I think is kind of cool. I like when they do, like, fake, like, fake, like, 
shirts that are like sort of like almost like props. Like I have Ooh, like an a, Xa big Xavier's shirt. Mansion one. Yeah, this is what sort size of, is this one? That's a large. Yeah, that's a big shirt. Right large, there. large. It feels like a big shirt. I think it's it's blue. Blue is a loud color for yeah. a shirt. And these, these little guys here. Uh, Where are these? Up. Yeah, I'll open these. Couple little up. bobble boys. So what do you got there? You got a Funko. Yeah, the usual Funko. This one is uh, just a good old fashioned Spider Man. And he's got his little web wings. Take a look at that little guy. Look at that man right there. I like him. If you hate us showcasing toys, you're gonna hate this next segment, which is also us showcasing toys, because that is what we do here. Ooh, Max, this is so unsettling. His head came in backwards when I oh, first no, got him. Oh no, he looks like that copper tone girl. Like a dog bit his underpants or whatever. Oh my god. Yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah these are, that's, that's an odd toy. He also, yeah, okay, there's him. That's that one. Yeah, and then there's a little one of the vulture. These are, these are funny. It's kind of weird to have them blind bagged, but then they show what they are on the, on the box. Did he come with a stand, or no, he's just... Okay, oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sweet. Those are cool. I, like I actually that. really like that vulture design. Yeah, he's a cool one. Funny little guys. Yeah, there we go. Now, Spider-Man fights a lot of stuff, but one thing he's never fought is ghosts. And that's why the Ghostbusters are here. Yeah. What was that? I have no idea what that was. That was a loud noise. Uh, we've talked about this before on the show, um, but Playmobil, the weird German toy company that isn't Lego, has teamed up with Ghostbusters in the year of our Lord 2017, the hottest year for Ghostbusters fandom. And they made, uh, they made a bunch of uh, Ghostbusters stuff. So. Yeah. They sent us over the Ecto-1. Uh, if you've never had a Playmobil growing up, um, they don't usually come packaged with knives. I just left that in there. Um, they uh, they kind of, you have to assemble them a little bit, but they're not like full-blown like Lego. They're kind of like Ikea toys, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but this one, it's got the lights and the sounds. And it even has, it's pretty, it's pretty annoying. I'll, I'll turn that off. Um, it's even got some slime, so you can just sli you can slime the Ooh, car. Look at that! It's like weird sticky slime. You can just put it all over the all you over can the just stick car. Stick it anywhere you want. Oh, yeah, that's exactly. great! I love like um, that. I'm gonna put this on your dad's ass. Yeah, exactly. What's really weird though, and these are these are awesome. Let's take a look in here. They got all the the proton packs and stuff, which are just like I don't know. I grew up playing with Playmobil. They're like a just funny little European people. Uh, if you p had to pick your favorite Ghostbusters that would come packed along with the car, who better than Janine and Winston Zetamore? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, they do have other, other ones in the line. Um, I got some pictures of them here. There's also, um, there's Slimer who comes with this regular ass hot dog guy who's just trying to do his work and the ghost came and ruined everything. He seems happy about it uh, though. And then there's the, there's the huge like, you know, the, the, the firehouse where they'll hang out. What a wreck. They really put that slime all over the place. Is somebody yeah. lose a bet at this company and just make, they, they, they made 2,000 slimes that I got like to put in every box? This is what, these, these slime pieces are, are one of those things that are not going to age well. Like in, in like three years, it's going to be all cracked and dried out and collectors are going to be all upset about it. Um, but yeah, they also have, uh, they also have the, the, the Zool dogs, the hellhounds or whatever. And uh, yeah, and this, this. Do they have the <laughs> ghost that goes down on Dan Aykroyd? Glow in the dark ragtime, man. No, they don't have that ghost. You can make that ghost happen, though. I feel like they probably <laughs> show have... that ragtime man again. This guy? No. The, yes. This, he's ra horrible. this weird ragtime genie. What the hell? Um, yeah, check us out. They've also got the uh, <coughs> the, the, the trap here. That's really like, bad. And you can like you can stuff ghosts inside it. Yeah, I love this. Playmobil's play been like quietly making some really awesome stuff. Um, yeah. I was a big fan of them when I was a kid, and then I dipped out for a while. Yeah, and then we started dude. looking at Playmobil websites during meetings when we're supposed to be paying attention or whatever. Yeah, they're making a, a pyramid. Which you can totally kit bash and make like an Assassin's Creed Origins uh, toy set out of. It's like the front half of a pyramid, and you can make a bunch of like men and women slide down it. Do you ever see that that, bum, bum, that bum, part bum, in Ghostbusters bum, bum. where ah! the, the ghost gets in the car and just starts possessing it and running over everybody? Yep. Um, I hope we we Here's start getting. Here's a movie I'd want. I, I want to see. That's a, that looks like a terrible movie. Jar 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 Ghostbuster car. I don't know what you even call that. What would you What would you do with that? I don't um, know. You make so a million yeah, like, dollars and go home. Um, it was just recently announced Funko is doing these like double sized Playmobil toys. So like these figures, but six inches tall, based on uh, I think it's Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, and Ninja Turtles. Yeah, I think those are the ones they announced. Maybe Power Rangers. Um, and we were like, that's cool-ish. Uh, we like the designs, but where are the actual play sets? And then they came out with these, and we're like, oh okay. So we might be getting proper Playmobil Ninja Turtles toys, which would be awesome, um, as well as like, you know, a Back to the Future DeLorean for Playmobil people to play with. Yeah, that's awesome. I hope we get like a Playmobil like party wagon full That'd of turtles. Cool also, with Back to the Future, it makes a ton of sense because there are all these different Playmobil time periods, like there's knights and pirates and stuff, so you could just have like Marty going around and you know, playing with your Playmobil stuff. We're adults! We're adults and we do this. We have these conversations. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, as adults are prone to do, we like to read the newspaper, which is where you find Garfield. Unless 
Garfield makes apps, which, oh, guess what? He does, because nothing is sacred in 2017. Let's take a look at the latest Garfield app. Hey guys, Max here for Up at Noon, and I'm playing one of the hottest new games out for your telephone. It's called Garfield Go, and it's all about going out there, being Garfield. And if you've played the, the other game, Pokemon Go, it's very similar. You've got this map. But this time you're Garfield, and you get the coins, Garfield's favorite item to collect. Let's take a look at what happens. Oh, look. He's just floating there in the void, and you just throw the food at the man. I didn't, I didn't get him. Oh, come on, Garfield. Oh, come on. So I, I guess I didn't get the stupid ass cat wouldn't get, couldn't even feed him the donut. So if you do get it in there, there's a treasure chest, and you get to unlock all these great comics, such as these classics. Hi there, I'm Garfield. I'm a cat, and this is my cartoonist John. This is actually the first one, but I only have the second panel, the three panel strip. Oh, but wait, there's all, all sorts of features in this great game. Hats that you can buy for real American money. So you can put Garfield in a nice fedora. Garfield Go is available from where the telephones have the games on them. Probably shouldn't play it. I love that you just like Abe Simpson out of that video. Like you showed up and you're like, oh, he's doing that Garfield thing. All right, I'm leaving. I put my bag down and I was like, what the hell is this? Show up to work. I don't know why you're promoting that guy's games. He blocked you on Twitter. You that guy. That guy, Garfield. Jim, Jim Davis or Garfield? The man, the cat, the, the Garfield. Man. Yeah, it is. Haven't you ever seen that picture of Jim Davis where he's standing next to Garfield and there's a big ass dude in the suit and they're just like, oh. Uh. It's a pretty good image. I like that Jim uh, Davis was like, hey, uh, just a heads up. Uh, we never intended for Garfield to be funny. Did you see that interview the other day? No. Yeah, he straight up was like, it's not supposed to be funny. I'm like, well, what the, f what are you doing, Why'd man? you put it in the funny pages? Didn't you know what that's what they're, they're called the funnies. Why is, why is it there? Like, what, is even it supposed to be like a sports report? Like, you, you missed the wrong section of the newspaper by drawing an orange cat. Even Family Circus is funny, because it's like, how many families can we fit in this circle? Oh, one? Yeah. Oh, you did it again. What, what's that little boy been doing? He's been all over those yards running or around. Or Doonesbury. You're reading Doonesbury. You're like, oh, I don't, I don't get it. I've Somebody never does. understood Doonesbury. Ever. Yeah, because I've never closed a stock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, so great yeah. great work. If you're sick of Pokemon Go, yeah. a game with also like support. It, I, I had this thing pop up Characters there. you love. I like found a treasure chest, and there was like, you got... One quarter of a MasterCard $10 gift card. And I was like, I feel a little bit weird, I think. Wait, what? Like a I, real one? I'm not sure if that's spyware or what. It's a, not a great game. Do you get, like, lasagna pieces? Yeah, you can throw lasagna in his disgusting bowl, and then he'll find a treasure chest for oh, you. Maybe was that covered in the video we just showed? It, the game doesn't even work that great. I, I was trying to look in the other direction. Yeah, I couldn't even get the cake in that stupid bowl. Anyway, um, speaking of video games, we want to talk about E3 for a second and just kind of share some stories. We do all these, like, high-octane sort of reaction pieces where we're like, hey guys, we just checked out the PlayStation Please show let's talk about what we saw. But like, the actual moment-to-moment -moment stuff of E3 is yeah. where it is entirely much more interesting and strange. I think that's what people forget, right? Like E3, and we, we're guilty of this too, we put out these big videos every single year and it's just like, it's like E3 promises to be the greatest thing that's ever and it'll come to your house and give you a massage and all this other, and it's like a laser light show and it's like the Super Bowl meets eSports meets video games and like there's like these drone shots of like, of, of Los Angeles yeah. and it's all this other stuff, but really like, Video games are uh, an incredibly intimate ex experience between you and your television. Yeah. Like, it's a quiet thing you do at home on the couch, usually with the lights off and your surround sound up, and, you know, you, maybe you got your VR hat, you got a controller in your hand. Maybe you're, like, your bros are on the phone, and, you know, you're voice chatting with them. But it's really, 
It's intimate. And E3 is about 150,000 people a day coming together to celebrate intimacy. Like, it's kind of odd. But, uh... No, there's that, there's that misconception of, like, uh, E3 is one of the loudest places I've ever been. It's this constant dubstep and fog machines and lasers and stuff. And some of those things show up in video games. But for the most part, the process, like you said, of gaming is, like, it's a thing you do. Kind of, it's, it's kind of a solitary activity. Occasionally, you know, you do have, like, loud party stuff and there's arcade culture. But this was... That whole kind of E3, like like showmanship is sort of a creation of, of marketing, which yeah, is what it is. Know, it, and, and, it, and it basically is, right? And if you look at like the press conferences, they're they're just as guilty of that. Uh, you look at Microsoft's, which was 90 minutes long and looked like the the night parade they throw at Disney World, where it's just like everything's got laser strips all over it. There was that man shout casting yeah. in the middle. Introducing of the next segment <laughs> is a brand new Porsche car. Yep. And then and then you have Sony and they're just like, we hung dead bodies from the stage to show you that there's dead bodies in this game. Also, stuff's blowing up. Yeah. Fog machine explosion. And then they're like, what? they used to show those indie montages. They'd be like, and this fall, Thomas was alone. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. And it's like, well, what are you doing, man? Like, it's not really about that. So to me, E3 is a place where all of that happens. And in spite of all of it, uh, these wonderful, quiet, intimate little moments happen. Like, um, I, I got to interview uh, Igarashi, who's been working yeah. on like the last 10 awesome Castlevania games. Uh, I had this fantastic moment on the last day. We talked earlier about uh, IGN giving Game of the Show to Super Mario Odyssey, which we all adored. Um, it was one of the few times in my career here where I've ever seen Game of the Show go up and the comments are immediately like, yeah, yeah, totally, I agree. Yeah, nailed it. Yeah, that game looks really fun. You throw your hat at the at the frog. It was also I love it. it was also really funny because up until that, it was it was a very close very close running between Spider Man and Mario, which, again, we're all adults here, but the argument was like things that second graders argue about, which was who would win, Mario or Spider Man. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so Spider Man can shoot with Mario can jump. Hat. He's got magic hat now. So the director and producer of Mario Odyssey come on our stage. They're wearing hats. Uh, I'm ecstatic. I present them, you know, that the fact that they won this award, uh, and I heard them sort of like when we were doing mic checks earlier, which you didn't get to see. Uh, they were, they, I was like, can you guys talk? And they have a Japanese interpreter, and they were talking in Japanese, but then every now and then one of them would go, wahoo, mamma mia, mamma mia, wahoo. And I was like, <laughs> so weird. So I was sitting next to them, I'm just sort of giggling. So we do the video, and uh, I'm like, congrats, you won, this is awesome. So I guess the only thing left to say is, wahoo. Mamma Mia! And I say, Wahoo Mamma Mia! And then they start saying it too, and it's this magical moment. And I jump off stage, and I shake their hands, and then I walk out, and the, the guy who made the thong song, Cisco, is standing outside of our booth, because Cisco, who's a super nice guy, uh, is also a big IGN fan. He's a big kind of funny fan. You've seen him sort of like in, in our cool big circle of friends. Uh, he like watches Beyond every week. He watches this show sometimes. Um, there was a while on this show where I would start the show going, what's up, 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 what's up? He tweeted that he started doing that to people. There we go. There it is. Uh, and then I turn over and Mega Ran is there, who's a rapper we got to work with. You saw him in some of, some of our uh, Florida Everglades Maybe videos. Maybe you're familiar with some of our hovercraft films we've made. But. And then two feet over there is Harley Morenstein from Epic Mealtime, who comes over and gives us a hug while we're meeting fans. And that all happened within, like, an hour. Like, this is all, like, and the, the last part of that story was in, like, 30 seconds. So, to me, E3, yes, it is this bustling, huge trade show with thousands of people screaming. And 15,000 fans are, are there now. And, it, you know, there's, there's dubstep and there's an upside-down world of tanks tank. But, really, yeah, yeah. it's really about just those little, little moments. And there's also the fact that I think gaming is a thing that really attracts everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very strange to be like, sure, the creator of... of Castlevania. He's somebody you'd expect to run into at E3. But then to be like, oh, there's professional wrestler Xavier Woods, who we've had on the show before. Yeah. Just to see him, and he's like, yeah, he's like hanging out and playing games and covering the show because he loves video games. And yeah. I don't know. It's, and and it's he comes awesome over like and he's that. like, yeah. he's like, hey, I want to come by your booth. And we're like, oh, this is really cool. It's like, it feels like this like cool summer camp. Yeah. And that the, I, got, I got to meet the like one of the guys responsible for the game Blaster Master. And then the next day, you and I met the woman who's been basically in charge of the score for every Metal Gear game for for yeah. For what the, and I was like, she's doing some like VR project or something. But we we're just we we're talking, and I was like. It's like, dude, you compose Snake Eater. Yeah. Like, so I think it's this reminder that like video games are loud and they are screaming and there are the thousands of people interact with them. But when it boils down to it, like individual people are working on these things. 
Um, and I've said this for years now, but if you're playing a game and you like it, reach out to that developer and let them know. If you see someone in the credits and they did something cool, tweet at them and be like, this is awesome. I mean, this is something Greg and I used to say way back in the old Beyond days. Um, going to E3 is really awesome because you get to interact with these people and meet them for the first time. But uh, yeah, thank you for watching our E3 coverage from like the bottom of our hearts. Yeah. It's a terrifying thing oh, and to all get the, up there. All the people we met who watched this stupid show where yeah. we play with Jar Jar Binks and Playmobil. Thank yeah. you for coming up and saying hi because uh, yeah, the internet has a lot of loud, crappy, mean, angry comments, but actually interacting with somebody in a positive fashion is such a Wonderful thing. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, track down somebody who made something you appreciate and give them a holler. And if you ever get the chance to meet them in real life, uh, I don't know, say say nice stuff. Or, you know, fight them in the street. What? what? No, wait. No, no, no I'm don't just kidding about that. Don't fight anybody in the Where street. Where did that go? No, no, no. Don't fight them no, in the street. No, go down in the rumpus room if you're going to rough house, all right? Anyway, uh, that's up at noon. We did it this week. Uh, we went through a lot. We played with the toys, and we put the slime on the car, and we talked about the guy that, that made Arrested Development. Hey. What a strange hour that was. I think you've been very good. You deserve a sticker. You got slimed. Simba. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That was up at noon. We'll be back <laughs> next week? Next week? Yeah, next week. Next week. Yeah. Next week. Business as usual. Yeah. That's what, the new name of the show. What year is it? Good night! <laughs>